no role plays, just real. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. We've never really, as a workforce, spent a lot of time on making sure we're developing good leaders. We'll be able to share stories, experience, mistakes, uh, failures, successes. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, today I would like to talk a little bit about having difficult conversations with employees and um, specifically around the conversations that include performance management and counseling and ultimately ones that may even lead to, I'm sorry, this place isn't a fit for you anymore. Hmm. And and I the reason I want to talk about this is because I feel like a lot of the leaders that I have had through my career have fallen into two one of two groups. Either they have no problem having difficult conversations but they lack empathy and compassion. And it's like, you know, talking to a robot, it, there's, there's, there's a need that needs to get done, a conversation that needs to happen and they're going to make it happen and that's it. And you're done and you move on. And then there's the other group of people who have a, a good amount of empathy and compassion and they care about the people they work for or the, the people that work for them. But it also is almost debilitating from the standpoint of having to have difficult conversations with those employees. And so they, they, make accommodations for those employees or they explain away in their own mind why a person should be able to do certain things because it's better than having the conversation. And, you know, so there, there's kind of these two groups. Very few people are able to have that, find that sweet spot where they know a conversation has to happen. They know an expectation has to be met or a behavior has to change or a person is no longer a fit for the organization and they have to make that happen. And then they're still able to execute on those conversations with the empathy and compassion that allows an employee to exit the system gracefully. And the the importance of that is not just from a moral standpoint. Like it's the obviously it's the right thing to do if you can do that. But the business needs dictate that it has to be done regardless of if you're good at it or, or not. There there's actually a business case for being able to do this, I think. And that's along the standpoint of, you know, we're we're in this this kind of radical transparency age with glassdoor.com and social media and and if you are turning over people and they are leaving your organization, they're still potential customers of your organization. And if you have a large enough organization, then you could potentially have a lot of either really big fans that used to work for you or some really big naysayers that used to work for you and no, long, and no longer work for you. I remember anecdotally, um, more than a decade ago, there was a stat that I read that at the time we, I, was a, I was a Best Buy. And they said that the annualized turnover for the comp- the whole company was something like 70%. And that, that was high, but not, you know, it was it, it was regular for retail. So 70% of, a, of, a, of the people, that's 70% of, a, of more than 100,000 people are different every single year. And if you have 70,000 people exiting your company every year, you want to make sure that they're not collectively talking bad about you online or to their friends or, you know, they're, they're, they're still potential customers. You still have a vested interest in making sure that people who no longer work for you think highly of you as a leader and of your company. So I'm wondering what experience you have with this in terms of being able to help people get through um, problems they're having performance wise, counseling wise, or ultimately how you help people exit the system gracefully, um, if that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I know we've spoken before about it on the show, just in regards to, you know, talking with transparency, getting to know people, building relationships and things like that, because that's going to always be super helpful in having any type of conversation, whether it's it's a good conversation and you're trying to provide somebody with recognition and then maybe either, you know, some some redirection or gentle guidance on helping them not just get their job done, but also accelerating and, and being able to perform at a higher level. Um, or if that's, you know, in this instance, having conversations with people who are underperforming or are, you know, maybe not good for the business or are over it or jaded or whatever the reason is that they're showing up at work and not either delivering on the expectation um, or at minimum just being a positive person and helping to support their peers. You know, it's funny you were mentioning the business case and kind of the the importance of remembering that everything is about making sure people have a good experience that you can control. I was just watching this morning at the gym uh, a couple of videos. I was I was on YouTube Googling things like retail leadership, retail manager. And what happened was one video uh, from a kid uh, or from a guy that, that had 
had a, a, a rather young retail manager career, had started somewhere at 16 years old as a cart runner and kind of worked through and then got a, you know, a, a, a retail manager style degree in college and then had worked for some other big box companies. Um, he was talking about having left one company to go to another one and, um, and, and was giving some examples of that and, and how, you know, his, his, his situation was such that the first time he did it, the, the, his leader was very, very supportive about talking to him about, you know, taking opportunities, taking chances sometimes, you know, taking what you know and taking what you learn and going on to another organization. Um, he said that he went to that organization and the experience wasn't as great and, and the mentorship, the training, the development wasn't as good. And he decided to leave that organization to, you know, and was interviewing for another organization and he went and talked to a leader. And that leader there, very different style of leadership and said, what do you mean you're, you're leaving? Like, are you telling me that you're quitting? Like, why would, you, why would you ask me for your help to get a job somewhere else? And it was just a really bad experience. Um, and then all the videos beneath that were people saying, I left this company. I left that company. My leader was this. My leader was that. And so I, I share all of that because I think it ties in to that element of how do you have honest conversations, trans transparent conversations with people about their performance. And sometimes that means they need to leave the organization because they can't meet the expectations regardless of the role that they're in or any of the out, you know, uh, extenuating circumstances. They just can't do the job. And I firmly believe that the only way to have those conversations and, and, and have it be the best experience possible is to have at least some elements of that relationship built and have had previous conversations with that person, at least just to get to know them, at least maybe to hear them out, even if they are wildly off base with why they don't want to work there, why they're so upset, why they're so negative, at least give them the opportunity to explain themselves, tell you why, see what you can gain from that, see if you can make any adjustments in the environment, uh, but at the end of the day, if you're going to represent your brand and represent yourself as a leader, it's important that you build that relationship first and then you have those real kinds of conversations. Yeah, I, I also think that it feeds itself um, in, in the negative. So I, I think back to being a child and being told by my parents over and over again that if I just spent four or five minutes a day cleaning my room, that's all it would ever need is that four or five minutes a day. Um, or I could do nothing. And then on Saturday, I don't get to go out and play or have fun with my friends because I'm spending three hours cleaning my room on Saturday. And it, it's it's the same thing. I think I think a lot of leaders justify not having the difficult conversations for small behavioral modification items because they say, well, it's not it's not hurting things too much and I don't want to have the conversation. So I so I just let it go. And what they don't realize is that 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 potential conversation or interaction is practice for the day when you have to let that person go eventually um, or not. Hopefully you don't. Hopefully the change happens and you can move on and, and be great. But if the worst case scenario is that eventually that person who's having a minor behavioral problem has to exit the company and you have to be the one to do it. I mean, think about how daunt. I mean, the daunting cleaning a room on a Saturday when you've done nothing for a month on it. It's even more daunting to have to sit down a person and tell them that you have to let them go when there is zero relationship because you've never taken the time to address little things when they're happening, even if the termination is justified, even if you have the paperwork in place and all your ducks are in a row. It's just it, it, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. In fact, in fact, I was in a position where I was asked to terminate somebody working for an organization and I had been in role for three days and had never spoken to the person before. And I, I did not, I refused. I said, no, I'm not doing that. You, the person who, the person who no longer works here, who is at a different location now needs to come back and, and make that happen. I'll sit in on it. If, you know, for legal purposes, I'll be there if you want me to be there, but that's, it, it's not the right thing to do to have it be done by someone who they've never met. Mm -hmm. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't cause I didn't take the time. It was cause I was, was brand new there. And I, I think that that's, uh, that's a, a, it's almost like, you know, putting off something that you can do now, putting off to later, to later, to later. And eventually it just becomes overwhelming. Um, and it's a situation that would be legitimately scary to get involved in is a, a conversation about putting somebody on a, you know, suspension or terminating them when you've never had that conversation before. I'd be scared to do that. You know, like you don't know what to expect. You don't know what they're, how they're going to respond. Um, you don't even know 
if the stories that you have on why they deserve to be fired, if they're even complete, you know, if they're, if it's one side of the story versus another, um, I'm not saying that, that, that railroading is a, a common occurrence, but it happens, you know, it happens yep. to some good people, um, who get caught up in the wrong situation. So, you know, I, I, I really think this is, this has to do with putting in the work every single day so that it, it becomes less hard so that you, you know what to expect when you go into the com- the conversation and you, and you know that that person views you as an advocate for them as well as an advocate for the business. Yeah, I think two things. Um, when, when, when you are a leader and, and this is a part of your job responsibility and you know it's inevitable, it's going to happen, is I think, number one, you know, it's important to communicate this um, and, and say it publicly. You know, I, I, I'm known for having conversations with my teams and in meetings or even in, you know, um, break areas in regards to like people hanging out and talking or chatting or whatever the case is, where I will say things like, man, I'm so proud of this team or this is so great or, hey, I appreciate your your positive energy or somebody will ask me a question about something and if I have the opportunity to explain, like, look, at the end of the day, we want people that work here that really find joy in what they do, that have a positive attitude, that show up to work on time, you know, that show up to work at all, and they're helping all of you achieve the things that you all want to achieve. So many of you work so hard to want to have these aspirations and get these opportunities, get these promotions, and just work for a winning team that we can't afford to have people here who are not positive, can't come to work, or have no intent of helping any of you. That's my role as a leader is to have the conversations with those people. So if they don't want to work here, we're on the same page. They don't want to be here. I don't want them here. Um, and I'm like, but that doesn't make them a bad person. That just means that they're not fit for this role here. And my part of my role is to help them go somewhere where they can have success and be happy. And I say that out loud and I say that in meetings and I say that when I have groups of team members together because number one, you have to let them know that that's a part of this business and that you are fine with those conversations and it also lets them hear if they are one of those people. If they're one of those people that are thinking about it, that they, they know that they're negative or they've been given feedback or they're not engaged and they hear a leader say things like that, it helps to start some of those conversations and it empowers the team to kind of fight against that negativity and help, you know, manage some of those people out through the right ways, which is building a culture of positivity and such that people, you know, that are negative or or don't want to do the work, they feel like they no longer belong. So that's that's number one. Number two, um, having any conversation with somebody that results in them no longer working for the organization. Unless it's something like theft or like a, a situation where you have to catch somebody doing it, and here's the facts, here's what's going on, you don't work here, when it's performance-based, attendance-based, or anything beyond a major legal issue, my philosophy is it should not be a surprise when you hand them the paperwork and tell them they no longer, no, they no longer work here. That conversation should have already been had before. And what I mean by that is that you didn't tell them, oh, hey, check it out, um, you're fired, but I'm going to give you the paperwork tomorrow. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you have a conversation with them and say things like, hey, Chris, so I know we've had a few conversations before around your lack of performance, around not meeting expectations, and we know you've set personal goals. You know, I've talked to you about it. Other leaders have talked to you about it. You've committed to doing things, and then you've not done those things, and then here we are today. Mm-hmm. So, you know, do you understand that based on this behavior, there's a high likelihood that you will not work for this organization based on your poor performance? And you have that conversation and you talk to that person and, and, and you, you let them know that this is the path that we're on, this is where we're at with it, and that there's no gray area on, you know, did they understand what I'm saying to them? And you say those types of things where then you would want to say, well, like, well, what do you mean? Does this mean I'm getting fired? Well, well, what do you think? You know, we've had these conversations. We've talked about this type of thing. You've made commitments. You've not lived up to them. If you were the leader, Chris, what would you do with an employee like that who refuses to do what's expected? And by having these conversations with them, it helps them to start to connect the dots so that at least when you have to set them down in the office and and provide them with their termination letter, then it's not the first time they've heard this type of language, nor is it a surprise that they don't understand why it's happening. Yeah, I I think some of the best relationships that I have had in business have been with a couple of people 
who reached out to me after they exited gracefully from an organization and the process of the performance management and the counseling and the and the repeated meetings and and conversations about expectations what it led the employee to was a place where they thought you know either a i don't enjoy this work or b it just isn't something i'm passionate enough about to get better at so it's it's not that I'm not necessarily a fit for the organization. It's that this work isn't a fit for me. Right. And and how an employee internalizes that makes all the difference in the world as far as whether or not they're going to go on a glass door and Facebook and and Twitter and start bad mouthing you as a leader in the organization or whether they're going to look back on it as the one of the best moves of their life because it allowed them to exit and get into something else they were passionate about. You you helped them figure out that they weren't happy about what they were being expected to do. And that doesn't make them a bad person. It just makes it so they, they should be spending their time focusing on something they do love doing and that they are passionate about. And and that's like the, the best case scenario. You have these conversations up front when you're supposed to have them. When the time comes to cut ties, if, if an employee can leave an organization feeling that way, that this was the right thing to do for them, because it, it's going to allow them to get into a different uh, a different space altogether. That's a win. No 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 formal employee like that is going to be talking bad about you or your company um, on on social media or or painting a bad picture of it. Yeah, I think something else to add to this conversation is that many times um, there's really really good people, really great people that are on your team that also need to lead the organization. Sure. Right. Because in, in talking to them and having conversations and understanding their motivations and understanding their personal professional goals, what you find out is that they do a really great job for you, but they went to school for this, or they have a passion for that, or they want to start their own business. And so the same type of conversation that happens with somebody who is underperforming in, in the level of transparency, the level of connection, the ability to help them connect the dots and find out what's going on. I've had the same style of conversation with people that are fantastic of saying, well, you do great work here, but every time I talk to you, you're talking to me about your two-year plan, which is not here, which is doing this type of work in this type of field, or it's you know taking this, this hobby of yours and turning it into a business. So like if, if that's where you're trying to go in life, that's another part of my responsibility of a leader is to help you achieve that personal dream as well or help you get to that that part of, of the career that you want to get into. So there's been many times where I've I've had fantastically great people that that of course I didn't want to lose. Um, but they're they're great and because they're great. Um, and because they have other aspirations, my role is to help them go there as well. So we've talked about, you know, interviewing for other organizations and, and following a career that's within their, you know, their education field. Um, it's helping them write the resume. It's helping them with interview skills. So I think that that ability to help somebody, you know, leave the organization because the same thing could happen, like where they're great, they do a great job. And then what do you do as a leader? Try to convince them to stay. Well, why, why would you want to do that? Why, why not stay here? You're giving up all this stuff. You know, you, you could be this in this time. I could fast track you to this. You start dangling carrots and doing all these things to try to keep them around because they drive something for you when inevitably at the end of the day, the right thing for them is to go and to find success in the thing that they really love and the thing that they've been trying to do. They may come back. They, they, they may try that for a while and say, you know what? It wasn't what I thought I was. I miss this. This is where I want to be and I want to grow. But, but you have to be able to let them go the same way and support them in that way as well. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. And I think it brings to mind something that I think a lot of leaders forget about. And that's that the, the deciding factor on whether or not this will go well or not really has to be rooted in the psychology of the, of the person. So a lot of people out there, they, are, um, they have an aversion to making a decision, a big life decision. So there are people out there who will dislike going to work. They don't want to be there, but they also won't quit either. They won't leave. It, it, it's like they they want to force the conversation to happen so that you end up having to fire them so that they can walk away from there going, I didn't quit. I was fired. You know, the decision wasn't in my hands. Somebody else took it from me. And that is a that's an easy way for them to go to sleep at night thinking that their their destiny wasn't in their own hands, that someone else took it from them. And that might feel better in the moment, 
uh, versus making a decision to quit and 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 having that 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 anxiety that comes along with with switching careers or switching jobs. But the people who are are most successful when those transitions happen, whether they do it on their own or they're forced to do it, are the ones that get to a place where they internalize that it was the right thing for them. And so you make it you gave an example of a person who was, you know, studying for something else and their two-year plan is not this organization. I had an employee working for me at an, at an organization who was going to school for fire science. They wanted to be a firefighter. And it had nothing to do with where they were working now. They were they had to pay the bills while they were going to school to be a firefighter. And so it was never a question that they wouldn't that they would that they weren't going to be there eventually. They when they graduated, they were going to apply and get at a, get a job as a firefighter somewhere and they were going to leave me. And we knew that from day one that it was a that it was a temporary thing, and so when it came time to leave, there was the the psychology of that person was that this decision was in my hands. I made the decision to leave, and it was a great decision. And no one he never thought thought twice about it. But you take that same person and you take the decision from them, and you take that you decide to let them go from an organization, and that becomes hurtful. So I think a lot of people, they think they want the decision to not be in their own hands. They think they want the, the, to shirk off the, the anxiety of making that decision and say that someone else made the decision for me. But, but if you look at the, the happiness of the people who do end up making the decision on their own, it all lies there. It's all in those people. So if you can take that and help a person get to a place where they understand that this organization isn't the right fit for them, and they end up making the decision to leave on their own, that is like the the best possibility for making sure that a person has the 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 compassion from you and the empathy from you, um, but also that you're accomplishing the business needs. Yep, I completely agree. And with that, it's time for this episode's One Minute Hack. The One Minute Hack. Okay, for this episode's one minute hack, what I want you to do is start doing three things. Start start asking three questions of every employee that you have to have a conversation with that is anything other than positive. Any type of performance counseling or uh, expectation of behavior modification, any conversation like that, you want to start by journaling with that employee on three things. One, what are they excited about when it comes to this job? What do they like about it? What do they dislike about it? And what is their multi-year plan? Not not 20 years in the future, but even just one or two years in the future. Find out that information and write it down so you know what about every employee that reports to you. And you can use that information to help an employee get recast either in a different role in your organization that is more fitting to them or help use it to help them leave the organization if the time comes where that's a necessity. But you can draw back on that in future conversations that you have with them and say, hey, you know, remember the last time we talked? You said that this is what you weren't excited about, and you know we're, we're having our second conversation about it now. Obviously, you don't you're not passionate about this. Let's let's help you find find some place where where you can use your passions um, better and, and do something you actually enjoy doing. Maybe that's with this organization, and maybe it's not. But if you approach these conversations armed with that information, you're much more likely to have your advice come from a period of I'm advocating for you, not I'm trying to get rid of you. Yeah, I think it's a great one minute hack, and and I just really appreciate the you know, proactiveness to just, you know, the conversations and aligning with them and trying to define whether or not they're just happy to be there and, and starting the conversation there. Because if you can find out quickly whether or not that's the case and whether they have to say things like, no, no, I, I love it here, then you can walk down a path of a conversation of like, well, then why do you act this way or why do you not come to work? And if they say things like, I'm just not happy here, you say like, hey, I, I can understand that. What can I do to help to get you someplace where you can be happy? Yeah, that, that's totally true. And everybody can have a bad day or, you know, or a bad week. But if it's a daily thing, it, it needs to have a conversation. Yep. And with that, it brings us to the end of another episode. This is Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you guys next time.